Green, sustainable and digital. Three ingredients of the European Green Deal and growth model. What are the transition pathways towards such a green, digital and resilient economy? Is it time for a great European makeover? Let's take a look behind the scenes with Sylvie Lemoyne of CEFIC and Peter Corritar from the European Commission DG Environment. Peter, what are the key ingredients of the European growth model and the chemical strategy for sustainability for this historical transition of the European industry? Indeed, we are undergoing a very historical transition here now. It is a green transition, it's a digital transition, and everything this is happening in the situation where the world is not very stable from the security point of, uh, point of view, which calls for the more security in the supply chain. So what are the key ingredients uh, for making this uh, transition a success? I see so four main priorities or more four, four key ingredients. First is to have a clear, stable and ambitious objectives. We need to know what we want to achieve and where we want to go. Only then we can achieve it. And for chemical industry and for chemical use, I think we are very clear in that. First, we want to decarbonize the production of chemicals. So by 2050, we want to be, uh, have an industry which is a carbon neutral. The use of chemicals and the production of chemicals, we want to make sure that we produce and use chemicals which are safe and sustainable by design, and we substitute as much as possible or where we can the one which are the worst ones. And the third one, we want to maintain the chemicals and the, especially the critical raw materials in the, com in the economy. So we want to promote the circular economy and reuse and maintain these chemicals and materials in the economy as long as possible. So that was the first uh, key ingredients. Second one is investments. Huh? We will need around 520 billion additional investments per year in the next decade to uh, manage uh, decarbonization and green transition, the other objectives, uh, protection of biodiversity, protection of water, pollution prevention. And then we need digital transition, we'll need an, an additional 125 billion euro investments per year. So it's a huge number and we need to make sure that these investments is ready. It has to be paid by the private companies mainly, but also by the, by the public funding. The third key objective, uh, the third, third key ingredients is, um, is reform. It's a reform of, of, of the rules. We need to make sure that the investments are flowing, that uh, there are no obstacles for the investments. We need to change the consumption and production patterns. And we need to make uh, uh, the transition resilient and inclusive. And the fourth ingredient is the cooperation. Cooperation at the EU level, member states level and with the private partners. Okay, so we need regulatory reform, we need 645 billion euros per year and we need cooperation. Sylvie Savic supports the EU Green Deal and has the ambition to be climate neutral by 2050. What does this transition mean for the chemical sector in Europe? Yeah, so I very much agree with what Peter said. We, we call it a double twin transition. Carbon neutral, in, in our assessment, the latest figure I've seen, the EU chemical industry to go net zero needs one trillion euro investment. It's not necessarily per year, so we would need to reconcile the maths, but it's huge. The message is, it's huge. We need massive amounts, and bigger than now in terms of terawatts, massive amounts of low carbon and affordable electricity, because our energy prices are still 60% higher than in 2019, and they're higher than in the rest of the world, which, which poses an, a, a problem of competitiveness right now. We absolutely need to go circular. We need, again, massive amounts of biomass, of new feedstock. We need waste to recycle at world uh, market prices. So we need to make circularity work. Uh, we need digital. Digital is rather an enabler, uh, but it has huge potential, as well as artificial intelligence, if done properly. But we need the skills for that. You need to attract the young generation. You need students to go into STEM. You need student, the young generation to believe they can make a change to bring us the new technologies. Now, in our industry, typically, it's 20 years investment cycles, right? So there's no room for mistake. We need to decide in the next five to eight years what we're going to do to reach all these objectives by 2050. And in addition, we need to know which substances or chemicals will be regulated when. 
that that's hugely important. And for now, the uh, the regulatory framework it's still is still a moving target. So that that's very important. So we need coherent policies. We need the people. We need the money, the investment. We need to de-risk the investments. Uh, so fundamentally, what we need is the business case to invest in Europe. Okay, thank you. So many necessities. Another necessity is that we realized over the last few years that for certain key materials we need as Europe to be self-sufficient. How can industry evolve to a more circular economy? So first, circularity is good for everyone. That, that's, the, that's the beauty of it. It's good for the business, it's good for the economy, it's certainly good for the environment, good for citizens and, and for politicians as well altogether. So, so there's a lot of potential there, uh, definitely. Um, we need an enabling regulatory framework, uh, the eco-design for sustainable products regulation, which is currently in the final phase of negotiation, should be an enabler if done well. Uh, it's going to create a, a bottom-up approach from the market towards more uh, sustainable, better designed, longer lasting products. Um, it's not the only thing. We certainly need, for example, the Critical Raw Materials Act. Uh, but at the same time, if you want lithium and cobalt to make e batteries in the EU, you, you also realize that lithium and cobalt are classified as CMRs, carcinogens, uh, under the CLP, which means under reach, they have to be regulated and in principle they should be phased out. So they should be phased out, but we need them for, for strategic autonomy. So we need this policy coherence. Uh, it's part of creating this you know, recycling and circular economy. We need new recycling technologies, for example, chemical recycling. And for that, you need also new partnerships. You need the waste. It's a solution to waste, actually. Um, but it has to be economically viable. I think we're going to see more and more uh, EPR scheme, Extended Producer Responsibility Scheme, uh, also as enablers for everyone in the value chain to take responsibility, to share the burden to some extent. So a lot of things uh, to come, but circular, circularity definitely uh, has plenty of potential. Very good. Peter, do you want to add something there? I think what is the most important to move toward the circularity is to bring the circularity issues already at the design stage of the products and materials and also of the business ideas, you know, of business opportunity. And I think that's what uh, eco-design regulation for sustainable products actually strive for. Uh, it does, it will allow to set the rules for, uh, for the products and set the, for example, recyclability um, criteria for the product. And also, it will try to in, in, in enable to enable or um, promote the market for the secondary materials. To, for example, set the minimum uh, amount of the secondary materials to be included in a product or in a material. So, I think this key, I think, would be to bring it down to the design phase and already there to consider it. Okay, thank you. Peter, in relation to climate change, earlier this month uh, the CBAM uh, was launched. How will this support the climate transition pathway and how can you reduce the risk of carbon leakage? Indeed, uh, CBAM, so Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, actually aims to become a tool which will uh, ensure equal level playing field uh, globally as regards the cost of a greenhouse gas gas emissions. As you know, in the EU, if you produce a, a product and you are emitting a CO2, you need to cover the CO2 emission by the um, allowances from the emission trading system. And this is obligatory in the EU, but it does not apply to the production outside the EU. So what this uh, CBAM or Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism aims to do is to mirror this ETS system, or uh, emission trading system, and to impose additional costs on the products uh, produced outside the EU, where the cost of the CO2 emissions were not internalized in the price of the product. So in principle, would, uh, it would help European companies to actually, uh, by the ensuring an equal level playing field in this respect. You agree, Sylvie? To a large extent, at least for, with the idea, which is uh, obviously uh, well intended. We, we, we love uh, level playing field and competitiveness uh, as a matter of principle. I think we'll need to uh, watch the implementation. There are a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, for example, on enforcement, how are we going to check uh, the carbon emission declarations? Uh, do we have the means to check what's behind or do we rely on declarations? 
Uh, we need to train the, the customs authorities. We need to have methods uh, to calculate embedded carbon. So it's coming with an implementing act. So the, in the, for the first two years until the end of 2025, uh, uh, fertilizers and hydrogen are to, the two parts of the industry, chemical industry, that will be covered uh, by CBAM. And then there's an intent to bring uh, other parts of the industry, and that will be massive, um, organic chemicals and, uh, and polymers uh, in the future. So I hope we learn uh, in those two years to come, because we're going to have to look at imports and exports, the volumes, but also the embedded carbon. And that will be used to set the price, start setting the price of carbon as of 2026. So I hope we can really learn in the coming two years before we extend the scheme. We can correct the mechanisms, we can optimize it. We hopefully it delivers what it's intended to, to deliver, which is a level uh, playing field. But it won't be easy, full of loopholes potentially that need to be worked out. And do you recognize the risk of carbon leakage? Yes, absolutely. And we want to address it. Well, this mechanism should address the carbon leakage. Carbon leakage means that you would uh, export your production outside the EU yeah. just because of avoiding the stricter regulation here. Okay. We want to keep production here yeah. at a competitive the level. Same. We want to keep them here. <laughs> Very good. We keep the production here. Let's strive for that. How can the digital transition support the green transition in the chemical industry in Europe? So from my perspective, first digital is everywhere. It's an enabler uh, at, at multiple levels. It, it's, you know, at production level, more reliable production, more productivity, logistics, uh, cleaner, cleaner logistics, uh, innovation. Uh, personally, my dream would be that we use all the data we've generated for ECA under reach uh, as a, and using uh, artificial intelligence as a mechanism to create the new molecules of tomorrow that have a low toxicity and a beautiful sustainability profile. And hopefully AI would actually help you design that. I'm sure some companies are looking into it, but if we had an EU approach on that, uh, building on what is a real asset from reach, the database at ECA, uh, I think it would be extremely valuable. So that's, you know, designing the right chemicals for tomorrow, the right materials. There is also enforcement. I think digital is a tool to improve enforcement. We have a deep need to better check uh, import in Europe. Uh, so we need not only more enforcers, but also better tools, more harmonized approach. Uh, it's also a tool to manage value chain communication. Eco-design, uh, circularity, requires a full life cycle approach with all players on board, including the importers, because a lot comes and goes uh, through our borders. So um, digital, digital product passport, uh, hopefully um, if implemented well, I think personally, I think has a lot of potential. So great enabler, but only an enabler, you need much more uh, framework conditions than, than digital, of course. Yeah. I would agree, the green, I mean, the digital transition is actually a great uh, enabler from, for the green transition. It's also different. Huh? Uh, the digital transition is driven by the technology itself. If you have a technology, while well, the green transition is driven by the objective and by the, our desire to maintain the life as we know it on this planet. So, it's a li so the technology for digital transition is there and we should use it for the best uh, for the green transition. From my perspective, it can help in, uh, in all objectives of the green transition. So greenhouse gas emissions, it can help in the protection of human health, protection of the environment, also move toward the circularity. And as Sylvie said, it's actually it can work. There are different benefits uh, at the different stage of the value chain. So it can, be, it can help in the research and innovation. So designing the products, designing the molecules. Uh, it can help to control and optimize the use of materials, energy, you know, especially with the grids, which are not, not going to be stable. We will need to have some systems which will keep the consumption varying depending on the availability of energy. And uh, the same, it can optimize the communication with the users. So, you, I mean, companies can better learn about the use of a chemical, how it is used, where are the potential both for exposure, but for the benefits and also optimize the distribution and the logistics. So I, I see a lot of benefits which could 
be, but of course, what we need the most probably will be skills because the combination, the the co the combination of a person who knows chemistry and who, who is interested in digital technology, artificial intelligence, it's going to be a very uh, rare person. A rare person huh? Yes. So what kind of digital skills are needed then, uh, Sylvie? Where you need, I, mean, I think AI is, is the way to go. Uh, but, but you need, tool, you need, eh? yeah. You also need to. You don't have the time to only bring new skills. You need to reskill, upskill the current workforce. I mean, having a, a good skilled workforce is one of the advantages of the EU. Okay. Yeah, together with single market, with a few things. But we have a highly skilled workforce. It's a competitive advantage. We need to keep it. And to keep it, we need to, to train those people to think sustainability, to use digital tools, to adapt, to accept that jobs will have to adapt. Certain jobs will disappear, others will be created. Uh, it's going fast, mm -hmm. so, so it's not always easy. Um, but I, I, I think that uh, it's this flexibility and speed of adaptation that we need. Following your line of thoughts, eh? uh, Skills are relevant, easier for the bigger companies, but for small and medium enterprises, it's a huge challenge. Any suggestions to enhance the digital skills there? Well, maybe via some partnerships. I don't know if they can come together or maybe some, some public-private partnerships or, or dedicated services for SMEs. Uh, we are looking into a project called Blueprint right now with, with the European Commission. Uh, it's not so much CEFIC, but we partner with ESSEG, with the employers' uh, organization, uh, in doing that. And, and part of it is really to look for mechanisms also for SMEs, how to reskill and, and upskill uh, uh, SMEs. So I don't have all the answers, uh, but we, I mean, SMEs are, are hugely important. They are the creativity the brain power of Europe, they have the agility as well. Yeah. They, they can go fast. So they need to be part of it fully. Yeah. Now the blueprint project supported by the Commission is, is great. Indeed, it yeah. touches yeah. on plastics, on yes. uh, consumer chemicals, fertilizers. It just started in September and it's going to be four years. So I hope that out of that we get great results. Uh, and if I may add link to that, university curricula also have to be adapted. That's more for the young ones coming in. But you need to train them at university to think toxicology, to think sustainable, to think drink. And that's part of design for circularity, design for, for greener products. Sounds great. A common expression is, if you can't stand the heat, stay out of the kitchen. We want a European makeover and not a European make-off. What possible incentives could be considered to avoid that key companies leave the European Union? Peter. Well, this is uh, a, a big challenge. Huh? So we need to keep our industry and we want to keep them as much as possible and we should do quite a, a significant effort to, to maintain it. So there is, we need to see why s companies could leave huh, from the EU. So where are the, the, key, the key drivers? So where I see one of the solutions is that try to do the equal level playing field as much as possible. The global standards, global harmonization uh, in the chemical field, the chemical conventions or a global chemical framework which we have adopted recently. This is the way forward. CBAM is another example which we should actually try to explore more. I think we should take advantage of our market which is quite attractive for, for the products around the globe and we should actually try to make sure that we have a really equal level playing field for people who are marketing uh, products on, on our market. So I think that would be one thing. The other thing would be to strengthen, as we discussed, the education. Huh? So, I mean, this kind of attractive thing or the skilled labor is attractive uh, commodity for, for the company. So that would be something, we have it, but we need to maintain it. We need to push it to those new, new areas, digitalization, the sustainability. We need to also, important is, I think Sylvie mentioned it, access to energy. Huh? This is the, the key issue. Huh? So we need to have a reasonable price energy and has to have a sustainable energy. So we need to help with investments towards there. We need to help with the uh, investment into the decarbonization of the industry. That's what I think could help. Sylvie. Yeah, I would uh, largely agree. Uh, well, not just look at what we can do with others to raise the standards, but actually look also inside the EU. 
For now, I mean, the business environment right now is, is difficult, so we are losing competitiveness. We lost half uh, of our exports, uh, of our market share in the world uh, in the last 20 years, in spite of a uh, global growth uh, projected for the sector. So in relative terms, we are losing. So we, need, we really need to think at the, uh, concretely and deeply what are the structural changes that are uh, probably needed um, for now, we are more uh, first thinker than first mover from that perspective. I think we should act, do, because others are acting fast. If you look at the US IRA or even China, when they go, they go fast. So what is it that, that we need? Absolutely agree. Uh, affordable energy, the price of energy is uh, the main killer element right now. We need, as we said, uh, predictable, stable regulation industrial emissions, we need faster permits, that's important. There's one example of a, a chemical recycling plant in France. A 1 billion investment, 200,000 tons of recycling potential for a polyester from textile. Uh, they got their permit in six months. They Great. have renewable energy, perfect. That's it. But, but for that, you need political will. And in other places, the average is rather a few years to get the permits. So you, you, you need this combination uh, and definitely some, some leadership to, to do that. So faster permits, wherever we can relieve administrative burden. Uh, happy to see um, Mrs. von der Leyen's uh, announcement of minus 25% reporting. Can we you know, take a fresh look at where reporting adds values, uh, where it doesn't or where, where it can be improved? We should look into that. Um, I'm sure there's a, a lot more. We should incentivize greener products because they tend to be more expensive. There, there's a cost to the transition. Someone has to pay the price. Of, of course, we need money to be injected into the system. We need massive amounts of funding. There are some funding. Uh, available here and there. It tends to be scattered. Uh, it tends to be on innovation and less on the scale up of innovation. So we have the brains, we need the plants and we need this and for this we need the, uh, the, the, the investments. But we need to look at uh, the success stories. So where is it that it worked? So not only look at those who are leaving but those who are investing in the EU and what makes the business case for them and build on that and reapply what we see being uh, successful. So in short, investment is needed and leadership in Europe. Yes, and support and, and partnerships, I would say. Okay. Um, Common goals. In Europe, we also want to inspire other regions outside Europe. And if the European transition would be followed outside Europe, that can be considered icing on the cake. However, we want to avoid greenwashing, both inside and outside Europe. What is needed to avoid this greenwashing? So I think one of the things that is needed are uh, uh, harmonized standard methodologies, for example, to calculate carbon footprint or under sustainable finance to do this uh, environmental and social responsibility reporting um, for life cycle assessments as well. For, so you need, you need all these standard methodologies worldwide and recognized. Uh, you need uh, transparency on the reporting, uh, definitely. So you need the data, you know, under, underpinning data, solid data, and a way to check that the data uh, is solid. So it's, it's part of, uh, of, of transparency. And you need enforcement. You need people who check. It's not only a declaration. We, also see, we already see some cheating on recycled targets, on recycled content of certain products coming from China. Who checks declaration? It's recycled. We have a no microplastics restriction, which is very complex. Who is going to check a declaration that says does not contain microplastics? Great questions, Peter. Great questions. And, and I answers. think I have a two. I, I would. I fully agree with Sylvie. I think I would just highlight two of them, which I for me are about. There's a clear cr criteria or rules or methodologies, a clear kind of rules. And the second, the, the enforcement. Let's, if we have them, let's enforce them. And because this is very important. I think the greenwashing is a big danger. It can consume a lot of funds, a lot of energy, a lot of efforts, and brings us not really where we want to be. 
and it destroys the credibility toward, I mean, the, the, the thing we need is consumer society to be on board with, with the transition, with greener products, with, you know, certain price to pay for better products and better living conditions in Europe. But if you, if greenwashes will have the counter effect, it will discredit all the efforts uh, towards the public. The chemical industry alone cannot fully achieve uh, the green transition and sustainability goals. Um, it requires collaboration with various partners and stakeholders to effectively address the environmental and sustainability challenges it faces. Who would be the main stakeholders to get involved? For me, I see the three main group of partners who need to work very closely together. It's academia, industry and the policy makers. So these three people these three groups of stakeholders need to work together. They need to reach out to investors and banks to actually facilitate that whatever comes up from this triangle. And uh, then, of course, in the EU, we have the specific uh, situation that we have a European Union, member states. So this is also key uh, place where the collaboration is to happen. What do you expect from the academia to contribute here? I think academia has to be the front runner of the change. Yeah? They, need, they should be coming with the ideas to, of the transformation, how, what would be feasible to find new materials. Look, we, we have published the uh, recommendation of a sane and sustainable by design chemicals and materials, which is addressed to research innovation in the companies, but also into the academia. So we need to make sure that they all know about it, that they use it, and they at least provide the feedback for improving it further. But ideally, they should be the one who will be driving this change and coming with a potential solution and selling it to companies. So there has to be close collaboration with industry and academia to actually f bring those ideas which are emerging into their reality. So this is what I expect from academia. Sylvia, what do you think are the key stakeholders? Yeah, I think I, I would agree. I would go a little bit beyond. So for example, within the industry, uh, you have new forms of partnerships uh, emerging because of new business models. So, for example, waste managers uh, and chemical companies need to work together because we need, for example, the waste in order to be used as feedstock to increase the recycling and recycled content. So that's, that's some new partnerships uh, happening right now. You need government and industry. There's a very successful circular economy initiative in Sweden, I've heard. Uh, where there was, of course, political leadership, but also business leaders getting together and agreeing on a number of measures to enable circular economy. That's a nice example of, uh, of, uh, um, of authorities and uh, industry working together, but there are other examples of public-private partnerships. Uh, you need suppliers, customers, uh, partnerships beyond what we do today. For example, to, ma to account for scope-free emissions, which are emissions, you know, from what you buy uh, in a chemical plant, but also through the life cycle, the use of the products. There's, there's a lot of emissions that, that come from both sides. If you want to reduce, you need to reduce altogether. You need to work together to, to, to help reduce. So these are just uh, another example is sometimes called industrial symbiosis. For example, you work, there's a, there's a project, I think of Dow and Thyssen Group where steel industry, you take their CO2 emissions and you actually use it at, as feedstock a few kilometers uh, down the way as carbon feedstock to manufacture uh, new, your new chemicals. You need carbon and hydrogen uh, to, to, make, uh, to make organic chemistry. So that, that's an example of new partnerships which goes beyond the, the traditional uh, models, sectors. Okay, great initiatives. Final question. For these key stakeholders eh, and partners uh, to start selling the transition pathways as hotcakes, what is needed to make it a success? The first thing is political will and leadership. I'm looking at uh, first, <laughs> first and foremost, um, you need to stick to your goals. I, I would very much agree. Uh, don't change the goalposts all, all the time. At some point, we, we just need to get into it. Ideally, and I know it's hard right now, you need economic and geopolitical stability because it's one of the fundamentals to reduce uncertainty. And of course, to invest, you need a minimum amount of certainty together with the risking, of course, but, uh, but, but you, need, you need all that. You need to attract the young talent, the new generation. You need to shape their thinking 
to be positive and, and geared towards sustainable, greener, digital. Um, there's a, I'm sure there's a lot of more things you need, but fundamentally, I think the, lead, the, the, the leadership and the drive of all stakeholders together. Same goal of all stakeholders. Yeah. Well, at the beginning of the interview, I mentioned the four ingredients. I think I can just repeat those. Uh, it's a basically the stable ambition uh, and clear goals. We want investments, we want reforms, we have a col collaboration. And maybe to those I would just add, we need investment in the skills. Huh? This is, I think, very important because we need skills which we don't know even that we need them. Huh? This, this is really a situation in such a way that we really need education very good. Second thing is that in order to ensure the stability of the society and every transition generates also disadvantaged groups. So we need to make this transition fair and inclusive. Huh? So we need to also think about the investments and the spending in that area to actually support that nobody feels be, uh, behind. And the third one, I think what we need, we need a good example, the success stories, you know, to sell, to show that, look, this is somebody or some business idea, business company. This is what they achieve and this was the drivers, how they manage, that the others get inspired. So, as you said, leaders also by example, doing by example. Sylvie and Peter, thank you very much for this tour behind the scenes. We can conclude that a genuine transition towards a green, digital and resilient chemical industry takes time. So this is definitely not a piece of cake, but the great European makeover is supported by many key stakeholders.